Okay, it should be uh, recording now. Uh, I see some some hands raised. Are, are there any specific questions that you want to ask? I, I believe that was from uh, all the recording uh, thing because it's been mentioned in the group chat. But... Okay, thanks. I will I will record uh, the part that has not been recorded, and I will upload that on the um, on the Blackboard page. Apologies for that. So, um, as I've said before, uh, there are some differences in terms of the of the materials. Uh, so, depending if you are using polymers or if you're using metals, there might be uh, differences in terms of the support structures or the, the need to use support structures for uh, building your parts. But we will get into that and we'll talk about that a bit more in detail when we get to the powder bed fusion part. Okay, are there any questions that you want to ask at this point? If you, if you have any questions, um, I will uh, reserve a bit of time at the end um, to go through some of the questions you might have. Also, if you've got any other questions, please do post them on the, on the discussion board. So I have, I have a question. Yes. So um, before using the 3D pro point printer, so we must uh, use a computer to um, slice the objects that we made, right? Yes. So before you actually manufacture your parts, uh, you need to design your parts. And then the, the triangularization and the slicing of your part is done automatically with the software. So you don't need to do that manually. It's an automated process. They can use uh, specific softwares to do that. And then after you do that, uh, it's generated a G code that contains all the information regarding the deposition uh, pathways to generate your part. And that information with those numerical coordinates is then sent to the 3D printed part, uh, sorry, the 3D printer that you have available uh, to actually physically recreate your object. Okay, thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. If there are any other questions, we can uh, go through them at the end of the lecture, okay? So, um, obviously, additive manufacturing in general, and I'm not talking just about a specific uh, process, uh, it presents several uh, advantages. So, one of the important advantages uh, is the low volume uh, production. So, for specific products, um, additive manufacturing can replace machine tooling. And by doing so, this allows for cheap, low value production and facilitates something that is very important that we've talked about in one of the first lectures, which is the ability to personalize and customize products according to the requirements of your customer. And this is something that is not possible of doing with conventional manufacturing because of the costs involved in the tooling uh, to manufacture products. Also, uh, another important uh, advantage is the lower cost production when compared to traditional uh, manufacturing systems. So, because in traditional manufacturing systems, you have to generate tools, you know, it can be a mold for casting, or it can be a mold for injection molding, or the tools to actually machine the parts. Uh, this will add extra costs to your uh, production. And 3D printing doesn't need the creation of any additional tools. It's just the use of the materials and obviously uh, the labor involved um, in the production of your parts. Importantly, additive manufacturing allows you to be responsive in terms of your uh, production. And this is particularly true for low volume production. So we when you have a small batch of products, uh, additive manufacturing offers much faster lead times than traditional uh, ma manufacturing mod methods. And why, why, why does that happen? So from the conceptual design until the manufacturing, you have to go through different stages. At some stages, there might need you might need to actually make um, changes in the design of your part 
because uh, it actually did, is not performing as you wanted to, or because the customer had changed his mind regarding some details of your product. And with additive manufacturing, you can immediately do those changes without extra costs. As in conventional manufacturing, that would require changes of uh, very, very expensive uh, tooling. It also allows you to shorter the supply chains. And AM has this capacity to simplify and to shorten these, these supply chains. So if, for example, if you are manufacturing parts on site, uh, then you don't need any transportation. And also, you, you, you can also uh, remove any unnecessary international shipping, which obviously brings the manufacturer uh, much closer to, to the customer and at much lower costs. And because of the nature of um, additive manufacturing, the layer by layer uh, principle, it brings um, a huge freedom of design. So in theory, any shape can be manufactured using additive manufacturing. Part consolidation, uh, for example, Additive manufacturing allows you to reduce the assembly requirements uh, by consolidating parts into a single component. Um, even complete assemblies with, for example, moving parts can be built with additive manufacturing. And this is something that, uh, this is an operation uh, that is normally required in conventional manufacturing, which is the consolidation of parts. You might need to fabricate parts separately and then put them or assemble, assemble them together. And obviously the increase in terms of the complexity of your geometries doesn't add any additional costs, which, is, uh, which doesn't happen in conventional uh, manufacturing. And obviously, finally, the elimination of any tooling as we've discussed before. And because of all these advantages, um, highly technological companies and areas of development are using additive manufacturing. And this is a, a very, very good example of how these advantages are being explored in Formula One, uh, where, for example, Formula One uh, motor racing engineers use these technologies to uh, rapidly and quickly uh, and in a responsive manner change the parts in their cars in order to improve the performance of their cars. I will invite you to uh, watch this video that is on uh, the Blackboard page, video one, um, that has uh, a clear example of how this technology is currently used in, added, in, uh, in Formula One. But obviously, there are also some, some challenges. And um, obviously, these challenges arise because additive manufacturing is uh, relatively new when compared to uh, more established conventional manufacturing systems. One of the, the challenges in terms of the materials, there is a clear demand for better materials. Uh, the development of, of machines that can process metals, you know, either by sintering or, or melting, has opened new opportunities in terms of uh, the use of these systems in the, the automotive industry and especially in the aerospace uh, industry. However, uh, these industries still require uh, plastic materials or polymer materials with much better performances to be used in, um, in cars, in uh, components for cars or for components in terms of aeroplanes. So metals are already being used, but polymers or plastics with better performance need to be uh, developed. There are still also challenges in terms of the software. Uh, most of the softwares that are currently used, they were not developed for additive manufacturing. So computer aided design is still designed for traditional uh, manufacturing routes, such as you know, injection, injection molding um, or casting, and are normally incapable of dealing with the freedom of design of additive manufacturing. So if you think about the typical design for additive manufacturing, uh, and this, figure illustrates clearly the stages of development uh, of a product using uh, additive manufacturing. 
Uh, you normally require the use of different tools, tools that can include, for example, topology optimization, design for multi-scale structures, multi-material design, because you, you might want to incorporate multiple materials into your uh, printed parts. You might want to customize your parts. So you want to do that, but you want to do that in a mass scale, uh, part consolidation, and also uh, other design methods which can make use of uh, additive manufacturing enabled features. So this integrated design approach for additive manufacturing is something that is extremely important and computer added design software is not tailored to actually deal with uh, this at the moment. Also, um, the affordability of uh, the systems. There is a huge disparity between the cost, for example, of uh, nylon material for injection molding, which normally costs about five pounds per kilo, and the same exact material for 3D printing, which can cost 10 times more. So we need to actually be able to homogenize the cost of the materials to reduce the costs of the materials for additive manufacturing systems. And overall, make the systems more affordable for companies and also for uh, individual users. The speed, the speed is also a, a challenge. Uh, for example, if we talk about the production of uh, small uh, batches, this uh, actually allows additive manufacturing in general to be faster in terms of the production of small batches when compared to conventional manufacturing. But if you need to produce thousands of parts, uh, this is normally much, much slower when compared to um, conventional manufacturing. So we need to be able to scale up our production with additive manufacturing by increasing the speed at which we print our parts. But also the size of that parts is in a way limited. So the building platforms are normally um, quite small and don't allow us to build large scale parts, uh, which is something that is possible with most of the conventional manufacturing systems. So more effort needs to be put in terms of developing large scale printers that allows us to print parts of similar sizes to the ones that are produced with um, more conventional uh, manufacturing like CNC. As, uh, as we've mentioned also as uh, yesterday, because of the layer by layer process, many of the components can present an isotropy. Uh, and this can be problematic in terms of the mechanical uh, performance of the parts. Surface finish and dimensional accuracy can also be uh, inferior when compared to uh, conventional manufacturing. And this is particularly relevant when you use powder based systems like binder jetting or uh, powder bed fusion. And that's why very often, <coughs> sorry, very often you need to do post-treatment to improve the quality of your surface and the, uh, <coughs> the dimensional accuracy. <coughs> In terms of uh, the reliability, this is, uh, this is something that has been um, improved over the years, but again, and as we've mentioned before, because uh, additive manufacturing te technologies are still more or less in their infancy when compared to more well-established uh, conventional manufacturing systems, uh, they are not as reliable um, in the long term as um, other uh, CNC machining systems, for example, or injection molding that can produce thousands, millions of parts without having any problem or required substantial uh, maintenance. So this is something that has been improved, but still needs substantial uh, work to actually reach the level of more well-established technologies. So this is just for you to have an idea about uh, the, the advantages, but also to, to be aware that additive manufacturing is uh, not the solution for everything. You, we need to be very careful on uh, deciding which uh, manufacturing process to select depending on the number of parts that we want to build, depending on the costs, and uh, we need to weight very well uh, the requirements for the performance of our uh, parts as well. 
In terms of uh, application domains, this is quite vast. And uh, probably it all started with um, the use of additive manufacturing to very rapidly create prototypes. They were not functional prototypes, they were simply prototypes. Um, then uh, later on, around 1994, additive manufacturing uh, was commonly used to create uh, rapid casting systems. Um, it was then used to create tools for more conventional manufacturing systems. But it was in uh, the 2000s that actually the adoption of these technologies uh, took a big leap when uh, the automotive industry started to use powder bed fusion systems uh, to create plastic parts uh, for um, cars. And since then, with the development of um, machines that can actually process metals and create uh, 3D parts using uh, high performance metals, that additive manufacturing uh, actually took off. And this was mainly because of the adoption of these technologies, uh, metal uh, sintering, uh, and metal uh, powder bed fusion by the aerospace industry. This was uh, further uh, supported and the increase in terms of the adoption of these additive manufacturing technologies um, was further supported by the use of additive manufacturing in the healthcare field. So nowadays, um, the healthcare fields is probably uh, the most important uh, market for additive manufacturing technologies with the need to develop customized implants, prosthetic devices, and other systems as we will see uh, later on today. So as we said, the aerospace industry plays a big part on this. Uh, currently, there are already parts being manufactured using SLS and SLM, like fan blades and fuel nozzles, but there are also much more ambitious uh, projects like the one proposed by Airbus that already came up with a roadmap to create an entire uh, airplane using additive manufacturing by 2050. And they actually expect uh, that, uh, that the whole manufacturing process and the running costs will also be uh, cheaper because the, the weight, the overall weight of the airplane will be uh, much uh, lower when compared to the current process that they used to uh, manufacture that planes. The initial um, adoption, the, the automotive industry continues to increase the number of parts and the range of parts that are manufactured uh, using additive manufacturing. The majority of the parts are produced using uh, polymeric systems like SLS, uh, but more and more metal uh, powder bed fusion is being used to create parts for um, our uh, cars. But it's not just the direct production of parts that uh, is important for additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing, as we will see uh, when we get to the casting parts, can also be extremely important to create tools for other uh, more conventional systems that are used to create, for example, uh, cylinder blocks for our cars. So. The, the number of parts that are directly or indirectly produced using additive manufacturing technologies is absolutely um, uh, increasing uh, over the years. But also uh, consumer products, things like uh, customized food plates or shoe soles are uh, regularly manufactured uh, by uh, companies and customized also by, by companies according to uh, the requirements of their clients. Uh, of their clients. Uh, jewelries can be 3D printed uh, using gold or silver or other uh, metals. Uh, some more adventurous uh, projects like printing a th uh, three-dimensional dress or shoes, uh, but very, very common in terms of furniture and lighting. And here, uh, the main advantage is the, the range of materials that can be used to produce all these consumer products and the ability to basically create any shape that you want to. Other less common areas 
uh, or, or probably uh, areas that the general public is not so aware where uh, additive manufacturing can be employed uh, is the food industry, not just in terms of decoration of cakes, but to actually produce meat. This is uh, Andrew Forjax, he's, uh, he's an American researcher um, and he was probably one of the pioneers in terms of this um, bioengineering of food. And basically, in very, in very briefly, what they do is they extract cells from uh, animals, so stem cells, cells that are undifferentiated. And what they do is that they combine these cells with polymeric materials, natural polymeric materials, and then they print them with the shape of a steak or a burger. And then they provide these cells with uh, chemical, uh, physical stimulus to guide that differentiation into specific uh, tissue cells, like cells that originally make parts of bovine steak or of a burger. And this is what they are pioneering. There have been several advances. And if you want to know more about this, you can easily find information about 3D uh, bioprinting of food uh, by Andrew uh, uh, Forjax. Also, architecture finds quite a lot of applications, not just uh, the creation, for example, of uh, models, but to actually 3D print entire houses using concrete. And this is particularly important when we think about natural disasters, where there are uh, no resources, and that you very quickly need to 3D print a house to actually provide shelter for people that have lost their houses due to these natural disasters. I'm not going to uh, stream this video here, but you can look at this video. This is just an example of um, 3D printing of houses in China, but there's quite a lot of research in Liverpool and across Europe in terms of 3D printing using concrete uh, materials. And as I said before, the medical industry with prosthetic devices, metal prosthetic devices, um, ankle, knee, any joints can now be 3D printed and used to, be, uh, to replace articular or damage articular uh, joints, uh, dental implants and bionic ears. This is something a bit more uh, recent in terms of development and something uh, a bit more simple like a 3D printed cast that can be more lightweight than uh, the normal uh, cast that uh, we uh, normally have when we go to the doctor with a fractured bone. And um, in a slightly more advanced um, application of these additive manufacturing technologies that is more closely related with my uh, personal research, the area of biofabrication. And you probably remember in the first lecture, this is basically the combination of medical imaging with 3D printing technology, where we use cells from um, the patients, we combine them with different natural and synthetic materials. And then we use 3D printing to uh, control their spatial positioning in a way that we can build an implant that will resemble not just geometrically or dimensionally the native tissue of uh, the patient, but can actually perform exactly like the damaged organ or tissue of the, of the patient. Once this is built, it's then vascularized and put back into um, the defects of the patient. This is an example of a breast that affect both men and women uh, at a very, very large scale and that we are particularly interested in investigating. There are other areas like bone regeneration. So instead of using metallic plates, if you break a bone, what we can do is to actually use materials that have the same composition of your bone. We can print it with exact same dimensions, implant it into the defect. And what will happen is that the cells of the native tissue of the bone with time will migrate into this mold that we have artificially created and they will adhere into, the, uh, into this mold they will degrade it and replace it with native bone. And this avoids, for example, the need for two surgeries, one to 
put the metallic plate and another one to remove it. It also allows for a much uh, faster regeneration of uh, the tissue. So this is another very important area of um, additive manufacturing in healthcare. And this is how we're doing that. Um, I'll just show you this brief video, how we are developing in collaborations with colleagues in the Netherlands implants for um, the cartilage. If you have a problem in the cartilage, like an osteochondral defect that progresses from the surface of the cartilage to the bone, we can scan that defect. The, well, the doctor can scan that defect. We can then reverse engineer that, create a CAD model. And once we create the CAD model, we can then select the adequate materials for the different regions, the bone and the three different layers of the cartilage. These materials already have the cells of the patient incorporated. And then what we can do is to print that layer by layer, the bone first, then we have the deepest layer of the cartilage, the middle layer of the cartilage and the superficial layer. Once it's built, what the doctor has to do is to go back to the patient, and this is done in uh, minutes, create an homogeneous defect and implant this biomold that contains the cells of the patient. And this will actually help regenerate, not just repair, but fully regenerate the cartilage and establish the, or re-establish the articulation uh, of the joints. And in terms of the future, well, I guess the future is actually uh, already happening. Uh, most of the, of the European space camp, well, agency, uh, European agencies are developing uh, funded projects to investigate how we can use 3D printing in space. <laughs> and you might wonder why is this important? And it is important for several reasons. One, because when you send astronauts to uh, the space, they uh, will need to spend long periods of time in, in space with very limited resources. If they have an injury, if uh, they need to treat that injury, then they cannot just go back to the hospital. So if we can develop 3D printing systems where they can actually print parts of tissues that can replace the damaged tissues that can be done automatically in space. But also we can start exploring the establishment of uh, a society in Mars, for example. So we can start understanding how can we be uh, sustainable? Uh, how can we develop tools to create objects um, tools uh, that we can use uh, for these establishments in uh, space. So this is uh, just to give you an idea of the different applications, where we are and where we can go with uh, 3D printing. And with this, I uh, conclude the lecture uh, for today. Uh, if you've got any questions, I am more than happy to answer them now. Hi, um, I've got a question. Um, yeah. What makes it on, what makes three D printing unreliable when you're trying to produce mass volumes or something? Sorry, can you please repeat that? Yes. So, what makes three D printing unreliable? So, such as this defects when you're trying to produce millions of parts, like you said before. Well, um, it, it's basically, it, it's not that it's unreliable. It's just when compared to CNC, because CNC machines have been around for many, many years and have been tested uh, in the production of millions and millions of parts. Uh, it's much more uh, reliable when compared to additive manufacturing systems that have only been around for a decade or so. So from that point of view, uh, I'm not saying that they are not reliable, but they have less reliability when compared to machines that have been tested over and over again. Okay. Sorry, I, I think your connection. Okay, I I hope that I've answered your question. Are there any other uh, questions? Uh, uh, yeah, hello, sir. Can I ask a question, please? Yeah, of course. 
Um, when you're talking about uh, 3D printing casts, are there any benefits uh, to having a 3D printed cast as opposed to a normal cast? Because they're, they're normal casts are these at the moment, they can still put them on really quickly. Yes. So it, it really depends on if it's just a very small, uh, simple fracture. Uh, sometimes there is no advantage in producing or printing um, a lightweight cast. But imagine uh, a very large fracture that will take a long, long time, and this can take months and months to fully regenerate. In that case, if you can have a cast that is lightweight and that doesn't interfere with your daily life, then it's worthwhile to actually use a 3D printed uh, cast. Um, for that. So as I've said before, it really depends and you need to be uh, very careful when you decide on the usefulness of additive manufacturing. Additive manufacturing is not the solution for everything. And in many situations, it's not the best option at all. It really depends on um, the use of your uh, parts of or, or, or of your product. And uh, obviously depends very much on the number of parts they need to produce. So you need to weight very well the advantages and limitations on using an additive manufacturing for that specific component. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Um, I've got a question. Is power bed fusion the only method to 3D print metal? Well, different metal. At the moment, yes. 100% yeah. metal, okay? Uh, because for example, you can use inks in uh, binder jetting that have a high percentage of metals, okay? But it will, the, the part that you will obtain at the end is not made 100% of metal. So the only system that can actually print 100% metal parts is powder bed fusion. Cheers, thank you. Uh, evening, evening, sir. When you Hello. talked about um, additive manufacturing having inferior quality in the finish, if um, you the part about polishing and finishing it over, would that count?